Hi there, this is Architect David. Welcome to Arkida, where you can learn anything and everything about construction. This video is part 2 of Architectural Acoustics. It is the last part of Architectural Acoustics. Acoustics refers to the way sound waves interact with the space around them. When this interaction results in an unpleasant auditory experience like echoing or reverberation, this means the area likely has bad acoustics. Believe it or not, the existing wall you have is acting as a soundproofing material in some capacity. But for various reasons, it may not be doing a great job. The goal when trying to soundproof a wall is to add acoustic materials which will combat as best as we can, the whole range of frequencies of sound that are coming through the wall. The picture shows the different types of how sound is treated. It can penetrate through your walls, it can be absorbed, it can reflect, and it can be diffused. If you've ever experienced speakers that sound great in one room, but sound worse when set up in another, this is likely due to the acoustic properties of each space. The sound waves from the speaker have different elements to interact with, so they offer a different sound experience. A space can experience problems with echo and reverberation because of one or more of the following. The first is hard surfaces. Hard surfaces are one of the most common sources of echo. When a sound wave makes contact with a rigid material, it reflects back into the room and makes it challenging to hear properly. It may feel like the bouncing sound waves are competing for your ear's attention, making it difficult to listen or concentrate. Hard surfaces that may be contributing to your space's poor sound payoff include the following. Bare walls, bare floors, empty walls uncovered windows, wooden furniture, metal tables or chairs, counters. Sound waves can bounce around freely if a space has too many hard surfaces and not enough soft, absorbent material. The more sound reflect of surfaces in one area, the more unpleasant it is to listen. High ceilings High ceilings can make a room feel open and beautiful, but they are also notorious for causing an echo in the area below. If you've ever clapped in a space with a high ceiling, you may have noticed the sound reverberating above your head for a period that is longer than the clap itself. Since the ceiling is far away from most noise, sources in a room or theater, it takes longer for sound waves to travel the distance and reflect back into the area below. This causes echo and can negatively impact a space's acoustics. Multiple noise sources. If you have ever been to a loud restaurant and found it difficult to hear what a person directly beside you was saying, then you understand the stress that multiple noise sources have on your hearing. When you factor in poor acoustics, the problem amplifies. A space's acoustics may fall flat if it deals with a lot of extraneous noise from sources such as people talking, traffic, machinery, air conditioning, and music. Some of these sounds may occur within your space, but others will be from outside activity. Depending on the noise sources, you may need to incorporate masking and absorption when addressing the sound problems. And the last is lack of materials to diffuse or absorb. When a room does not have any materials that diffuse or absorb sound, you can experience some serious acoustical issues. Soft materials cut back on sound, reflection, and reduce echo. Empty spaces typically have poor acoustics because the sound waves can openly bounce back and forth without coming into contact with materials that slow them down. The following materials can help with poor acoustics. Fabric curtains, foam panels, and cushioned furniture. 
Acoustic geometry shows how sound works in rooms using Nerf disc guns, 1,130 feet of fluorescent green string and moi patterns, and a before and after example. Hi, I'm John Calder of Acoustic Geometry. Let's talk about acoustics, which is basically how sound works in rooms. It may seem complicated, so let's make it simpler. Most rooms have flat walls and flat ceilings, and sound bounces off of these. So how does that affect the sound? I'll use these two Nerf guns to demonstrate. I've got this one aimed, so this disc goes directly to the ear. That represents direct sound. I've got this one aimed, so that disc bounces off the wall, and it represents reflected sound. I'll shoot them both at the same time. Reflected sound arrives at our ears later than direct sound, even though it started out at the same time, because it's traveling farther. And this wall is only one flat surface. There are at least six in the average room, and that's a lot of reflected sound. But why is reflected sound bad? I'll demonstrate using these two identical patterns. The blue pattern represents direct sound waves, and the red pattern represents reflected sound waves. They start out together, but when I move the red one backwards, like a delayed sound reflection, it creates destructive interference patterns which changes the original sound wave. Here's the problem. Original sound waves are distorted by strong, later arriving reflections. Also, sound travels really fast, about 1130 feet per second. A sound wave will bounce back and forth between these two walls about 60 times in one second. Sound travels so fast, it fills a room almost instantly. And this is only one bounce angle. Every room has thousands. How can we make our rooms sound better? Remember our Nerf guns? I'll shoot these at the same time, again representing a sound wave bouncing off a wall. Both discs bounce together in the same direction, which means the reflected sound is at full strength. Now let's use the first of our two acoustical tools, an absorber, to reduce the strength of sound bounces. To a sound wave, an absorber looks a little like a hole in the wall, so some of the energy doesn't come back. An absorber works by reducing the strength of reflected sound that would otherwise cause more destructive interference. But if we use only absorbers in a room, it makes it sound dull and unnatural. Historically, humans don't like overly absorbent rooms. So, let's use the second of our two acoustical tools, the curved surface diffuser. It also reduces the strength of sound bounces. A diffuser works by scattering the sound reflections in different directions, smoothing out destructive interferences throughout the room. Room acoustics are greatly improved using a combination of absorption and diffusion. It's all about reducing those flat surface reflections. Use a combination of absorbers and diffusers, and your room will sound a lot more natural. Thanks for watching. The STC, also known as Sound Transmission Class or Sound Transmission Coefficient, is a single number rating scale that measures a wall, ceiling, or floor assembly's ability to block sound transmission. The higher the number, the greater the drop in decibel levels bleeding through the surface. There are many ways to improve the sound transmission of class of a partition, though the two most basic principles are adding mass and increasing the overall thickness. In general, the sound transmission class of a double leaf wall, example, two 4-inch thick brick wall separated by a 2-inch airspace, is greater than a single wall of equivalent mass, example, a homogeneous 8-inch brick wall. Again, another video of John Calder of Acoustic Geometry which shows what acoustic panels are and where they should be placed for improving sound in rooms of all kinds.
Hi, I'm John Calder of Acoustic Geometry. We talk with thousands of people about acoustic panels and they all ask us what and where. So what are acoustic panels? There are two types, absorbers and diffusers, and they're both important to improving the sound of your room. We'll start by finding the first reflection points, which are simply the places sound bounces after leaving your speakers on the way to your ears. First reflection points have the first and worst effect on sound in rooms. I'll use my Nerf gun to find the first reflection point on this wall. Of course, you may not want to find your first reflection points like this. So here's an easier way. Get a handheld mirror and an assistant. Slide the mirror along the wall until your assistant sees the speaker's tweeter. Mark that spot with painter's tape, then repeat on the other side. Now you've marked your first reflection points on the walls. Which panels go there? Lots of people put absorber panels in their first reflection points, and that's okay. But a better option is to use our medium curve diffusers in those pesky first reflection points. It'll make your stereo sound stage wider and more focused because our diffusers are phase coherent. Flat surface reflections happen on all four walls. So let's place one small curved diffuser on the back wall and one on the front wall. We've mounted the front wall diffuser horizontally because sound moves in three dimensions and it fits with the TV. Because corners make sound bounces worse, we'll use a fabric wrapped absorber panel in each corner. Two in front reduce side-to-side -side reflections, and two in back reduce front-to-back reflections. That's it for the basics. These eight acoustic panels will definitely improve the sound of your room and might be all you need. All rooms are different, and your room may need more sound control. So let's look at the next group of treatments. The ceiling is a big flat surface area and should be treated. Ceiling absorber panels are called clouds. Two are placed at the ceiling first reflection points and two over your seating area. Or you could use our silk metal absorber tiles if you have a drop-in ceiling grid. These are cutting edge microperf technology. We're also adding a fabric wrapped absorber panel in each corner, further reducing corner sound problems. And we'll add one more medium curved diffuser on each side, at right angles to your seating position, which is where the most annoying flutter echoes occur. And that completes our first two groups of acoustic treatments. There's one more group of improvements if needed. Place a horizontally mounted small curve diffuser between each of the two sets of sidewall medium curves. And place our curve corner traps in any two of your corners. You can also add two to four more clouds. As you can see, you don't need to treat every square foot to have great acoustics. Remember, your panels and layout will depend on the size and shape of your room as well as windows and doors. Our terrific acoustic geometry dealers are always happy to talk about our products with you. Call or click, they're listed on our website. Thanks for watching. Acoustical absorption is the ability of a material to absorb rather than reflect sound. Sound transmission loss refers to a material's ability to reduce sound transfer from one space to another, example, blocking noise or sound between rooms. When referring to sound absorption, you should look for products that absorb reverberation and echoes in a room. If you want a product that will stop or block a sound, you'll need a heavier, denser material. Materials with high sound absorption are not great for stopping sound transmission. For example, concrete is great for sound transmission loss but not great for sound absorption. There is a way to quantify how much sound is reflected in a room by using a metric called the absorption coefficient. In a nutshell, an absorption coefficient is a measure of how much sound is absorbed and not reflected. The absorption coefficient ranges between 0 and 1. 1 meaning no sound energy is reflected and the sound is either absorbed or transmitted. For example, an opened exterior window has the absorption coefficient of 1 because no sound returns to the room. 
an effective absorber will have a sound absorption coefficient greater than 0.75. Cymatics It is the study of sound and vibration made visible, typically on the surface of a plate, diaphragm, or membrane. It comes from the ancient Greek word meaning wave. Cymatics is a subset of modal vibrational phenomena, and it is the study of visible sound and vibration. The concept of architecture as frozen music and music as liquid architecture describes how music and architecture employ the golden ratio, the geometric blueprint evident throughout nature to express harmony. This cymatics video features audio visualized by science experiments, including the Chaldney plate, Rubens tube, Tesla coil, and ferrofluid. The film you are about to see has no characters. If you spare a little of your imagination, it is a film to describe to you the effect of cymatic frequencies on matter. Everything owes its existence solely and completely to sound.
The study of cymatics reveals that sound vibrations excite matter into geometric forms, which coincide with the golden ratio. By placing water inside a loudspeaker, it is discovered about the hidden geometry of these resonant frequencies, hence translating sound into liquid architecture. Watching a cymatics experiment makes it possible to see that, that everything oscillates, vibrates, and undulates in nature, which orchestrates geometries found throughout the natural world. A researcher, Tanya Harris, employed the architecture of Nicholas Hawksmoor as an instrument to explore the relationship between sound and geometry within form. To investigate this concept, she recorded the resonant frequencies of four Hawksmoor churches and inspired by a technique discovered by Alvin Lucier, Harris recorded the silence of each church and played this recording back into the church while re-recording and repeated this process until the resonant frequencies of the church became audible. In a TED talk given in Louisiana, architect Shea Trahan discusses the relationship between architecture and sound through a series of live demonstrations and pre-recorded examples. Learn about how spaces can better utilize sound to become ideal places of therapy, study, and enjoyment. So to quote architect Sheehan, he said, As a designer, we create architectural spaces which are de facto instruments. They contain sound. They manipulate it. They can even create sound. So we are tasked with a very powerful tool for affecting human cognition. So, I have two seemingly unrelated passions. First one is architecture. The second one is the power of sound. The first one is my medium of expression. The second one stems from a deeply held belief I have that the world as we know it is simply manifestations of vibrational frequency. And I mean that on every scale. This is one of the earliest images we have of the early universe. NASA researchers found that out of this chaos came an organizing pattern, one of the first organizing patterns to the plasma cloud. It was a low frequency tone that rippled through the plasma cloud, and set into motion the creation of the galaxies and the universe as we know it today. Before matter existed, the universe was already singing. On the opposite end of the scalar spectrum, String theory posits that at our most basic subatomic level, we're all composed of one-dimensional strings whose vibrational frequencies define the laws of physics. As humans, we're not outside of this system. We're interactive players in this process, and we're very well tuned to do it. The human ear enjoys three times more neural connections to the brain than does the eye. We can detect a vibrating molecule as low as 20 beats per second, or 20 hertz, all the way up to 20,000 hertz. That's an order of magnitude of a 1,000 times, roughly 10 octaves of sound that you can detect. Compare that against the order of magnitude of visual sight, which is only two, or a, roughly a single octave, which we know as Roy G. Biv. So as a designer, we create architectural spaces which are de facto instruments. They contain sound, they manipulate it, they can even create sound. So we're tasked with a very powerful tool for affecting human cognition. And it was this passion that drove me in 2012 to embark on an international research fellowship, seeking out buildings that manifested specific sonic phenomenon for the stated purpose of spiritual or transcendent experiences started with resonance, and that's sympathetic vibrations which create amplitude. And I don't know of a better pair of words than sympathetic vibrations. Our world could use more of it. For this, I traveled to the island of Malta in the Mediterranean, and specifically to a 5,000-year-old underground temple that was discovered under these houses in 1902. It's a three-story temple carved out of solid limestone in the Bronze Age. 
of particular interest to me was a space called the Oracle Room. Archaeologists believe that this was reserved for the shaman of this religion. The roof is painted in spiraling red paint, which they suspect might be musical notation that we can't decipher. The reason the Oracle Room we're having battery issues. There we go. The reason the Oracle Room is so special is because it's a perfect resonating chamber for a specific frequency, 110 hertz. What makes it a resonating chamber? The dimensions of the space are an exact multiple of the wavelength of that frequency. So as I stood in the space, and I apologize for the lack of video, the sensitivity of the sound sight meant that they patted me down and I could enter with nothing. So as I stood in the space and began to sing, searching for that tone, as soon as I hit 110 hertz, I knew it because the space came alive. Sounds suddenly surrounded you from every direction. It sounded like there were people singing with you. The intensity got so strong you could feel the vibration through your body. This is the tone of the hypogeum. So what's happening? Why does it do this? Like I said, when I start to sing, my voice travels, hits the wall and bounces back in sync with my remaining voice. Now constantly, sound waves are interfering with each other and they usually muddy each other up. When two waves are in perfect sync like this, it creates a natural form of amplification called constructive interference or a standing wave. That's what created the effect that I experienced. So what? That's the sonic equivalent of an optical illusion, basically, right? And that's the exact question that a team of neuroscientists from UCLA asked in 2008 when they traveled to the hypogeum to study it. What they found was the brain, when exposed in the way the hypogeum does to that tone, experiences shifts in the prefrontal cortex and creates a functioning asymmetry within the brain. That's not dissimilar from the brain states of monks in meditation or transcendent experiences. And so archaeologists believe there's a possibility the shaman of this religion were using this chamber as a literal gateway to the doors of perception. If there's one critique of the hypogeum, it's that as soon as you stop the sound, it dissipates. For this, we introduce reverberation. Reverberation can be considered the, the amount of time sound lingers in a space after the source sound is gone. And for this, I traveled to the Baptistry of St. John in Pisa, two doors down from the Leaning Tower. Millions of people walk by it every day, and very few know what it does. A typical space such as this might have a reverberation time of one to two seconds, but because of the architecture of the Baptistry, it enjoys a, reverber a reverberation time between 10 and 12 seconds. I'm about to play a video with a single vocalist standing in the center of the space, harmonizing it three-tone chord, try and decipher what sound is coming out of her mouth and what sound is coming from the architecture around her. So if we can couple that sort of a immersive reverberation with the tones of the hypogeum, we can create something powerful. But what's happening there? Why is that happening? 
If we take a look at the baptistry in both plan and section, the first thing you should notice is that in plan, it's a pair of concentric circles. And so as she starts to sing, her vocal energy first interacts with the inner colonnade and bounces straight back to her. If we lay this out on a timeline, we can start to map out the reflections of acoustics within the space. Some of her voice travels to the exterior wall before returning back to her. Slightly longer travel time, slightly longer reflection. Some of her voice gets trapped on the return trip between the outer wall and the colonnade, further extending that reverberation time. And this happens throughout the space in all the nooks and crannies. Farthest traveling occurring, heading straight up to the peak of the ceiling before returning back. Now keep in mind, between reflection three and four, reflections one, two, and three are repeating the process over and over again. And it's this layering of sound that creates that extended reverberation time. As if that wasn't enough, a remodel to the building a few hundred years ago added a dome which encapsulated airspace which acts as a resonating chamber, holding those sympathetic vibrations and then returning them to the space, even further extending that reverberation time. So now we've built a language of understanding on how to use architecture to make such a powerful sonic space. But how does one even begin to design that, right? You just start drawing circles or something. And so for me, I return to science and to sound. This is a physics experiment in cymatics, which is the study of sound traveling through a medium. This is hundreds of years old, the, the knowledge of this process. It's simply a steel plate mounted onto a frequency generator with salt or sand sitting atop it. As the experimenters cycle through higher and higher frequencies, you'll see that the sound reveals itself in formal arrangements. We were able to do this dozens, if not hundreds of times, and get out individual fingerprints, each unique like a snowflake for various tones. Keep in mind, these are two-dimensional representations of a three-dimensional process. And as we started to study them, I could decipher general rules to their organization. As frequency increases, so does the complexity of the pattern. You can see that the lowest frequency at the top left is much more basic than the highest frequency at the bottom right. Additionally, every cymatic pattern is symmetrical about an axis. And this shouldn't be surprising because if you think about sound, it's traveling in all directions at the same speed. And so being a branch of physics, it can be defined by math. And if it can be defined by math, it can, can be put into the computer. And so that's exactly what I did. I designed an algorithm in my 3D modeling software that allows me to recreate the cymatic process in real time based on frequency, wavelength, amplitude. And then I can tell the computer, identify the symmetrical axes. And instead of mirroring as in 2D, we start to think of orbiting for symmetry in three dimensions. This allows me to now visualize the spatial configurations of each of these unique tones and manipulate them in real time. I apologize for the lagging computer. It's pretty complex math, but it's a fascinating process. I can't get enough of it, actually. So this being said, instead of dozens or hundreds of 2D prints, I now had a process for iteratively creating dozens or hundreds of three-dimensional spatial configurations. So I began to organize them based on frequency. Seeking frequency-based organizational patterns and thinking back to Pisa, I thought, why don't I start to group these things by harmonic frequency? So these are 3D prints of a harmonic triad, B flat major to be specific. What I was surprised by was that the tones that have a harmonic 
audible relationship also have similar formal arrangements. You can also, you can almost imagine form A evolving into form B, evolving into form C. And here's the tones that created these. In its creative tone. And my wife's favorite, the C major. So, as we start to envision these as an inhabitable space, we know by finely tuning the dimensional quality of this, we can achieve the frequencies that we wish. And by organized, layered, spatial complexity, just like the Pease Baptistry, we can create hyper-resonant and hyper-reverberant spaces, these ideal sound baths, if you will. So I'm now working with the team who's envisioning these on a variety of scales, from something small enough for one or two people to share some time in, to sonic exploratoriums large enough for three or 400 people. I'm also modeling more advanced mathematical processes through it, and it's opening new worlds that I had not even imagined with powerful spatial and formal opportunities. And how can we use these spaces? Well, like I said, there's an entertainment aspect to this in the sonic exploratory. These could also serve as immersive sonic therapy rooms for sonic immersion therapies that already exist for PTSD, depression, anxiety, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. These would also be powerful neuroscientific neuroscientific laboratories into cognitive and sensory neuroscience to further advance our understanding of the power of sound on the brain and body. But above all things, this started and will always be for me a chamber for sonic meditation and a pure temple of sound. Thank you. Now allow me to discuss a few of the technological advancements regarding sound. One of them is the Dolby Laboratories, often shortened to Dolby Labs and also known simply as Dolby. It is an American company specializing in audio noise reduction and audio encoding compression. Dolby Digital, also known as Dolby AC-3, is the name for audio compression technologies developed by Dolby Laboratories. The first use of Dolby Digital was to provide digital sound in cinemas from 35mm film prints. Today, it is now also used for other applications such as TV broadcasts, radio broadcasts via satellite, digital video streaming, DVDs, Blu-ray discs, and game consoles. And the next is IMAX, which stands for Maximum Image. It designs its movie screens to make an audience feel like it's right in the action rather than simply hearing and seeing the same old movie screen. There is a network of 44 patented speakers in the IMAX theater that emits a staggering 12,000 watts of sound. The speakers are directional, which allows them to distribute sound more evenly across the theater so each member of the audience hear as well as another. The speaker system also has a wider frequency response, making the high frequencies higher and lows even lower, so that they become vibrations on top of sound. It takes more than just blasting sound out of oversized speakers to produce the IMAX quality sound. For example, IMAX monitors the acoustics in the room and takes into consideration the size and shape of theaters. Furthermore, IMAX theaters have enhanced architecture with specific speaker placements and soundproofing for optimized hearing. Well, I hope you've learned something new again about acoustics and architecture. If you like this video, please press like. 
please press subscribe if you would like to find out the other videos that we have posted and press the notification bell to be notified of new videos that we post out. Click the subscribe button to discover all the other videos in this site. Click the notification bell to be notified about new videos that we post. If you have additional comments, please post them down below or at our Arkida Facebook page and I will answer all your queries. Thank you.